welcome. I'm David Wallinga, Director of Healthy Food Action. Welcome to the second in our four-part Meat Matters webinar series on the intersections between meat, livestock production, and public health. I want to thank our series co-sponsors, the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future, the American Holistic Medical Association, soon to be the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, the Alliance of Nurses for a Healthy Environment, <clears throat> excuse me, along with Healthy Food Action. Healthy Food Action is a nationwide network created to bring a collective voice of health, health professionals across disciplines so they can advocate together for the farm and food systems we all want, systems that are both healthier <clears throat> and more sustainable. Making sure the webinar runs smoothly today is my colleague, Rachel Gruel. Today's moderator is Keeve Nachman. Keeve is the Director of Food Production and Public Health at the Center for a Livable Future. He uses a multidisciplinary approach in his food systems research to characterize public health risks that can be addressed through modifications to production practices. Next, we hear from Keith. Keith? Thanks, David. It's a pleasure to be here today. Let's jump right in. Uh, we have two great guest speakers today. And before we introduce them, I want to help set the stage for the theme of the food chain or more specifically, the meat supply chain and public health. As many of us on the call are aware, the United States has an enormous appetite for meat and other animal products. Based on data from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, in 2009, the average American consumed 877 pounds of animal products, more than three times the world average, which is 292 uh, pounds per person. We rank number three in the world in animal product consumption, just behind Luxembourg and Denmark. To support an appetite like this, the meat production industry over the last half century has transformed into something quite massive. To satisfy the American diet, producers slaughter more than nine billion animals each year. Over time, an increasing body of evidence has emerged that demonstrates that the manner in which these animals are produced has an incredible toll on the public's health and in environmental quality. When most people think about how meat production impacts public health, they usually tend to think about diet-related diseases connected to diets that are heavily reliant on animal products. Popular news coverage is also frequently concerned with the safety of food in reference to the presence of pathogens or chemical residues in or on the surface of these products. While diet-related disease and food safety are certainly valid public health concerns, what's often overlooked or even forgotten by society are some of the upstream practices involved in the production of animals for food that can have quite dire public health consequences. The dominant model of meat production is something that we call industrial food animal production, or IFAP. It's a model characterized by large-scale animal production operations that are geographically clustered in certain regions of the country. They confine many thousands, and even in some cases millions, of animals on single properties. The animals are produced in a high-throughput manner, under contractually dictated conditions that specify everything from the composition of the drugs in the feed to the timings of the artificial light within the animal houses. The intent is to provide a uniform consumer product, which is typically done at a very small profit margin. This manner of production is well documented to be the origin of numerous multimedia environmental hazards, ranging from the generation of enormous volumes of manure to the release of air pollutants like ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, volatile organic compounds, allergens, and endotoxins from the production facilities, to infection risks from antibiotic-resistant pathogens. Further, these operations are more likely to be cited in poor communities of color where residents lack the political capital or economic resources to better their situations and may be disproportionately burdened with a lack of health care access and comorbidities. While much of the focus and attention on food safety risks centers around the concerns we all face at the grocery store, little attention is given to those on the front lines of animal production and processing. The meat production workforce has the most contact with the animals and the hazards and is thus at greatest risk of exposure to these, these particular hazards present in the production of meat. This workforce, which frequently goes unrecognized, involves those who work at animal rearing sites, at livestock production facilities, and at animal processing plants. We don't know as much as we'd like to about this workforce, but from what we can tell, the tasks involved in these positions are physically demanding, grueling, and in some cases dangerous. 
and those who supply this labor, for many reasons, may not be well suited to improve their working conditions or find other less risky employments. Arguably, these folks are among those who bear the most significant burden in making inexpensive animal products available at the grocery store. Now, I'd like to turn to our speakers, who will go into greater depth regarding the concerns by workers involved in the production of animal products. Ted Genoways, our first speaker, lives in Lincoln and is a fourth generation Nebraskan. His book, The Chain, Farm, Factory, and the Fate of Our Food, just released this month, follows the state of the meatpacking industry through the lens of Hormel and its most famous product, Spam. Ted's a poet, uh, a contributing editor at Mother Jones, and the winner of the James Aronson Award for Social Justice Journalism. Ted's writing links meatpacking to the low-paid immigrant labor it often relies on. Our second speaker, Joanne Lowe, lends her perspective as executive director of the Food Chain Workers Alliance, a national coalition of organizations of workers. She's also vice chair of the leadership board of the Los Angeles Food Policy Council and a board member of the Domestic Fair Trade Association. After our speakers, we've got 25 minutes of Q&A. But you shouldn't wait to submit your questions. Earlier is better. Look for a box on the right-hand menu of your screen that says, enter your question. Just type it in and hit send. And now I'd like to turn things over to our first speaker, Ted Genoways. Ted, take it away. Keith, thanks very much. And thanks to everyone who's listening in today. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this a little bit. As Keith mentioned, um, I've just published a book called The Chain Farm Factory and the Fate of Our Food, as you see there on the title slide. But just as importantly, um, as Keith also mentioned, I'm a fourth generation Nebraskan. And I came to this topic through my grandfather, my dad's dad, who, as a young man during the Depression, worked in a swift packing plant around the Union stockyards in Omaha. In many ways, his whole life was built around trying to make sure that my father, when he reached that same age, would not have to do the kind of work that he had done in the packing plant. So I have a great sympathy for the workers who endure hard work and high risk to produce our food. And starting about five years ago, I set out to try to get a better understanding of those challenges, um, the challenges that today's meat packers face in an in industry that's increasingly industrialized and accelerated. What I found out about not only the hazards to the workers themselves, but to us all, was shocking to me and deeply worrying. What I'm going to give you today is a partial overview. We can change the slide there. What you see here, um, these are the hands of Maria Lopez, a former worker at Hormel Foods in Fremont, Nebraska. When I visited her in her small home on the outskirts of town, she told me the story of one unforgettable day on the line in 2004. The worker beside her was feeding pork shoulders one after another into a spinning saw, just as he did every other day of the week while Lopez gathered and bagged the trimmed fat to go into spam. The facility in Fremont is just one of two plants in the world where Hormel makes its signature product. So the pace of work had always been steady there, but the speed of the line had jumped recently from 1,000 hogs per hour to more than 1,100, and Lopez was having trouble keeping up. As her co-worker reached for another shoulder, pork shoulder, Lopez rushed to clear the cutting area and her fingers slipped toward the saw blade. She snatched her hand back, but too late. Her index finger dangled by a flap of skin, the bone cut clean through. She screamed as blood spurted and covered her workstation. Later, a surgeon was able to shorten both ends of the bone and stabilize it with a screw, as you may be able to see there in the photograph. A month after that, Lopez needed another surgery to insert a second pin to straighten a crook in the bone. In the end, she lost all the feeling in her finger, but missed just two months of work. You can change the slide. Lopez told me that she considered herself lucky. Um, many of the workers, like Raul Vasquez here, who also works on the ham line in Fremont, and you can see um, where he's cradling his daughter there, that he's lost the index finger on, on his right hand entirely. When Lopez returned to work at Hormel after her surgery, though, she discovered an awful truth. 
while she sprinted to the nurse's station and was taken to the Fremont Area Medical Center, while she waited, her finger wrapped in the emergency room for the surgeon to drive in from Omaha, the cut line at Hormel continued to run. That hour, like every hour, without interruption, the plant processed 1,100 hogs. Their carcasses were butchered into parts and marketed as Cure 81 hams or black label bacon. The scraps were collected and ground up to make little sizzlers, breakfast sausages, and spam. Her co-workers were instructed by floor supervisors to wash the station of her blood, but the line never stopped. And since then, the speed has only increased. Next slide, please. So a little background on line speeds. In modern meat packing plants, the rate of production is set by a chain conveyor system like the one you see here at the top of this slide. The chain determines everything about how a day goes in the plant. And workers often talk about the chain as if it were a living thing and something to be feared. During times of peak demand, the companies speed up the chain. But ever since the reforms in the meat industry, brought on by Upton Sinclair's The Jungle more than a century ago, the USDA has set an unofficial cap on line speed by insisting on manual inspection of each carcass. Essentially, the line can't go faster than an inspector can manually inspect it. That is, until now. Owing to a special program piloted by the USDA in 2002 to test the effects of reduced inspection on food safety, five pork packing uh, facilities nationwide have been allowed to set their own line speeds. You see the five listed there. Hormel managed to get all three of its slaughter operations that it owns or operates into that select handful. The Fremont plant in, in, in Fremont, Nebraska, uh, the Quality Pork Processors plant, which is a subsidiary in Austin, Minnesota, and the Farmer John plant in Vernon, California, which Hormel bought after the advent of this program. Having three plants that could run faster than any other plants in the country perfectly positioned Hormel to capitalize on the coming economic crisis. Next slide, please. What you might uh, reasonably wonder, uh, does spam have to do with the recession? Well, a spam, as it turns out, is an excellent economic indicator. It was created and first marketed during the Great Depression, and ever since then, its periods of highest sales have been during steep economic downturns. When the housing crisis began to peak in 2006, and then the stock market crashed in 2007, the stumbling economy created a whole class of people who were looking for ways to trim their household budgets. Unfortunately, many low-income Americans who are already living close to the bone are forced during such times to cut back on their food budgets. And quality meat is one of the most expensive items in any grocery store. Spam, in particular, saw historic leaps in sales. And the value of Hormel stock prices have skyrocketed in recent years as well. Next slide. But now that there was runaway demand for spam and no government regulation to slow things down, Hormel kept pushing the line to go faster and faster. Consider this. In 2002, when the USDA's pilot program began, the production line at Hormel was running at 900 hogs per hour. By 2007, just five years later, it was running 1,350 hogs per hour, a 50% increase in just five years. And the number of workers on the line only increased by about 15%. So obviously, everyone is working harder, working faster, and mistakes occur, like the incident that I described with Maria Lopez. Statistically, people who work on any meatpacking line for five years have a nearly 50-50 chance of suffering a serious injury. And an extensive study of packing house workers conducted by the University of Iowa in 2008 suggested that the actual number may be significantly underreported. The Iowa study revealed that the large number of Hispanic workers hired by the industry in the last two decades are almost half as likely to report an injury as their white counterparts. One would assume that the rate of reporting is even lower among undocumented workers who are often underreport for fear of firing or deportation. 
Next slide, please. One particularly grim case of worker injury and discrimination involved a device known simply as the brain machine at the Quality Pork Plant in Austin, Minnesota. The mechanism was mounted at the end of a steel encased bench called the head table, which you can see is grayed out in the middle of this slide, where the workers sliced off the ears, clipped the snouts, chiseled cheek meat from pork heads as they came down the line. And one worker, marked there as the green circle, harvested the brains by inserting the metal nozzle of a 90 pounds per square inch compressed air hose into the opening at the back of each skull, tripping a trigger that blasted the pig's brains into a pink slurry. The brains, by the way, were sold into Asia as a thickener for stir fry. But each blast of air was also aerosolizing small amounts of porcine brain tissue, which workers were unknowingly inhaling. The workers' immune systems produced antibodies to destroy the foreign cells, but because porcine and human neurological cells are so similar, the antibodies didn't recognize when the foreign cells had been eliminated and began destroying the human neural tissue of the workers as well. In the end, the plant experienced what the Mayo Clinic described as an epidemic of neuropathy, and several workers had permanent brain, spine, and nerve damage. But after they filed worker compensation claims, Many were fired for not having legal work status. Next slide, please. These threats uh, to the health of plant workers are bad enough. Uh, but the never-ending speed up of pork production has also posed serious threats to the public health. In the last decade, Hormel was one of a handful of meat producers to attack anti-corporate farming laws across the Midwest. In Iowa, in particular, the company gained a special exemption that allowed it to take a strong hand in pressuring small producers to build giant hog confinement barns where sows are artificially inseminated, fed antibiotics, and held in gestation and farrowing crates. Studies spearheaded by the Environmental Health Sciences Research Center at the University of Iowa have found that roughly 70% of workers inside those barns suffer from acute bronchitis and 45% test positive for methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA. Even more shockingly, a study completed last year found that Iowans who live within one mile of a hog confinement, like the farmstead that you can see at the rear of this photo, are three times more likely to have MRSA than other residents of rural Iowa, and nearly 10 times more likely than someone living in an urban area, even such as Des Moines. And one key way in which that, that antibiotic-resistant illness appears to be spreading is via the hog manure, as you see spread here on this field, which is captured on, in enormous waste pits under the confinement barns and then pumped out and spread as fertilizer. Next slide, please. Because of the boom in the number of confinement barns in Iowa, the volume of applied fertilizer is now so high that the ground simply can't hold all the manure being produced, especially in recent years as spring rains have sheeted off of, of drought-hardened fields. That waste running off into the Raccoon River and Des Moines River watersheds, the two largest watersheds in Iowa, have pushed the daily loads of antibiotics and drug-resistant bac bacteria to levels that regularly violate the Clean Water Act. Hormel itself plays an interesting role in that problem because it was the Hormel Institute in partnership with the Mayo Clinic back in the 1950s and 60s that first tested and perfected the use of antibiotics in pigs as a way of keeping them in close confinement and encouraging rapid growth by altering the intestinal microbiomes of the hogs. Today, the abuse of that practice has led to a crisis for people who rely on wells for drinking water in Iowa and even for the people in the cities. Each spring, levels of nitrates, as you see here, are, are climbing and are now so high, often to two, two to three times the, the federal limit, that the Des Moines Water Works um, now issues what they call blue baby alerts to warn parents that the, the nitrate levels uh, would be dangerous and even deadly to children. Next slide, please. Last but not least, uh, the speed of pork production is now jeopardizing the 
the safety and wholesomeness of the national food supply. Last year, when the USDA's Office of the Inspector General assessed the outcome of the USDA's reduced inspection pilot program, the program that allowed the speed up of lines, they found that the two largest Hormel plants were among the 10 worst food safety violators in the country. During 2012 alone, as you see here, Quality Pork Processors, Hormel's primary cut and kill operation, received nearly 225 non-compliance records, including 60 violations for meat contaminated by fecal matter or other intestinal contents. More disturbingly, food safety inspectors noted eight separate incidents where carcasses had to be condemned for disease after having been approved by, for butchering by the plant quality assurance auditors. And several of these were classified as what the USDA calls stumble upon records, which is uh, chance findings um, past the critical control points, which should therefore be considered zero tolerance violations, resulting in shutdowns or suspensions of operation. In many cases, these violations were discovered so late in the process that the reports conclude with some variation of the same comment, which is, had the inspector failed to retain this carcass, it would have entered into commerce. But this plant, neither of the Hormel plants, was shut down. The chain never stopped. The USDA's own report warned, since there are no substantial consequences for plants that repeatedly violate the same food safety regulations, the plants have little incentive to improve their slaughter processes. Next slide. Despite these findings, however, the USDA is proceeding along a path toward implementing this reduced inspection pilot program nationwide. Remember, this program was tested out in just five plants. Now the government is arguing that the results of the program, just what I've described to you today, are sufficiently encouraging that we should expand from those five plants to all 616 plants nationwide. Food safety advocates are asking the obvious question. In what sane universe do you make America's worst violators into the new model for food safety? But that's where we're headed, unless the public insists that we won't stand for this anymore. We have to demand that our leaders create a system that incentivizes the production of quality, healthful meat. It means pressing the President and Congress to conduct an independent and comprehensive study of the effects of line speed increases and reduced meat inspection. And just as importantly, once we have such data, we must act on those findings. Thanks very much. Hello. Hi, everyone. This is Joanne Lowe. I'm the Executive Director of the Food Chain Workers Alliance. Thanks for having me on. David and Keith, and I'm honored to be um, following Ted and his presentation. So um, next slide. So just to share a little bit with you about the, what the Food Chain Workers Alliance is, we are a national coalition of unions, worker centers, and nonprofit advocacy organizations representing workers all throughout the food chain. Uh, these are logos of our 24 member organizations. Collectively, they have a membership of close to 300,000 workers. So you can see we have member organizations organizing farm workers, um, some organizing food processing, meat packing, and poultry processing workers, warehouse workers, workers in grocery stores, restaurants and food service, and also, um, as you can see, street vendors. Next slide. So in the food system, there in the US, there are close to 20 million people who work in this food system. So it's the largest segment of employment in the country, about one-sixth of the entire US workforce. Um, and it's also, unfortunately, the largest employer of low-wage workers. We surveyed over 600 workers around the country, all throughout the food chain, and we found that they earn a median wage of 9.65 per hour. And Although 13.5% earn a living wage, we found that one in, almost one in four were paid below minimum wage, and the majority are earning poverty to low wages. So, so this results that workers throughout the food chain suffer higher rates of food insecurity and use public benefits like SNAP, you know, food stamps, at a higher rate than the general workforce. Next slide. 
uh, specifically in animal slaughtering processing, over 500,000 people work in this sector of the food chain in the U.S. As you know, Keith talked about, this industry now has a large number of immigrants, um, many from Mexico, Central America, Southeast Asia, and Somalia. And according to government data, the annual median wage is 12.29 per hour. Next slide. So I want to share a couple of stories with you of workers who are organizing with some of our member organizations. Um, so this is Alicia. She's an immigrant from Mexico who came to the U.S. in the year 2000. She's 35 years old and married with two children. And she works two jobs um, she, because she has only been able to get a part-time job of about 22 to 25 hours per week in a poultry processing plant in northwest Arkansas. And the rest of her time, about 22 hours per week, she works in the morning mornings cleaning houses in the area. She has worked in the poultry processing industry for six years, and Elisa says it's, it's just terrible working in this industry. A lot of people don't feel that they have the option to express themselves. And she explains that many of her coworkers who are full-time often work overtime but aren't paid for all their hours of work. That's what we call wage theft. And there are people who really can't stand working there because their hands get swollen, their backs hurt, and due to the long time of that they have to stand, they can't stand the pain on their feet. And Lisa says, for herself, her hands and feet hurt a lot, but she needs to go to work because her family needs the money in order to pay you know, for their basic necessities. Her husband used to work at the same poultry plant where she works now. His job was very repetitive, and he got injured. But the company has been agreed to pay, you know, properly pay him for um, his injury and he can't work now. So she's the sole income earner for her family. Elisa believes that everything that the company produces should go directly to the trash because it lacks quality. She says the plant is very unsanitary and she, and she describes, quote, when you first start your shift, the aprons are dirty. They are from the previous shift. Most of them are covered in lard, and they stamp, still hand them to you like that. That is how you know that there are lacks sanitation. The floors are covered in chicken skin, and nobody picks them up. Even if there are ceiling leaks, the company does not stop the production. Also, some, sometimes pieces of rubber gloves get into the chicken. There is no quality or floor sanitation. All they care about is quantity. So Elisa became involved with the Northwest Arkansas Workers Justice Center, a uh, nonprofit organization and a member of the Food Chain Workers Alliance after she was laid off from a Cargill plant where she worked for five years. With the center, Alicia talks to other workers to encourage them to become a member of the center and to learn about their rights. Uh, and in the bottom corner, right corner, you can see that's Alicia at a protest. Every year we have hold an annual worker leaders retreat. And this year we were in Miami, and so she's at a protest there supporting farm workers in Florida who are organizing with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Next slide. So the second story I'd like to share with you is about Pedro. Pedro works at Farmer John in Vernon, California. He was born in Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico, and is married with two children. He has worked in the meatpacking industry for almost 20 years. And um, he's a leader of his union. So what's different between Alicia and Pedro's story is that Lisa, there's no union in the poultry processing plant where she, uh, she works. But at Farmer John in Vernon, uh, Pedro is a leader of the union. And so even though, you know, he still says, with the union, though, the, the line speed is very fast and it can cause, you know, problems. It's physically tiring. It's psychologically stressful. As you know, supervisors put a lot of pressures on the worker to work fast. Um, and for many years, supervisors would deny work as a bathroom break because they said there was no one available to replace them on the line. But since Pedro has a union, it's the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, Local 770, and also a member of the Food Chain Workers Alliance, he organizes co-workers and they want new restrooms closer to their line and they're not able to take bathroom breaks. And Pedro says that because of the union, he and his coworkers have health insurance with the company. He says he wouldn't be able to afford an independent medical insurance outside of work because it would be too expensive for him to afford a family plan on his salary. Next slide. So I just wanted to share some data from um, that the United Food and Commercial Workers International Union collected 
show the difference between non-union and union plants in terms of food safety. So what the UFCW did was they looked at four, the 450 of the largest meat and poultry plants in the U.S., uh, looked at data from 2001 to 2009, and they found that it, a unionized plant was less likely to have experienced uh, food recall than a non-union plant. And recalls at non-union plants tended to be for reasons posing a greater risk to the public public's health than recalls at union plants did. You might be wondering, well, how, why is this the case? Um, and you know, from from my view, in a union plant, the workers are feel more protected, and they can speak up if they see problems with production, problems in how food's being handled, and food safety, uh, and so those problems can be fixed more quickly. So, next slide. So I just want to share some of the efforts. You know, what are so what's happening? How are workers um, trying to change these conditions? All the terrible conditions that Ted talked about, and from the stories that I shared. Um, so one, you know, many workers are organizing, whether it's through the union, through UFCW, or through worker centers like the Northwest Arkansas Workers Justice Center. Uh, you know, they're organizing to improve conditions with health and safety, wages, having a voice on the job. Um, and UFCW is also looking into whether the overuse of antibiotics is a threat to workers, and really making that connection between the different issues that people are concerned about you know, in terms of the meat packing industry. Um, also, we are um, a member of the LA Food Policy Council. I'm based in LA. And we developed the Good Food Purchasing Policy. It's a comprehensive policy that includes standards around supporting the local economy, environmental sustainability, fair labor practices, the humane treatment of animals, and nutrition. And we formed a working group through the LA Food Policy Council to really develop this policy. And the LA uh, County Department of Public Health was a key uh, leader in that working group, along with you know farmers, food um, food distributors, uh, food service companies, you know, a, a wide variety of stakeholders. And so I think that's really how we came up with this. this what we think is the most comprehensive institutional food purchasing policy in the country. So it's been adopted by the City of Los Angeles, the LA Unified School District, and a food service company called Guggenheimer, which runs the cafeteria for Google LA. Um, and so we really see this policy as the way to change the market, so that more large purchasers of food are demanding more good food and, uh, and supporting good farms and good businesses that can supply what they want, and encouraging other farms and food businesses to change their practices to meet these standards. And I'm happy to give more information if folks are, are interested. Um, next slide. So thank you very much for your time. Again, here's my contact info if you want to get in touch after this webinar. And I think I'll pass it back over to Keith. Thank you, Joanne, and, and thanks, Ted, for those terrific and insightful presentations. Uh, I'm going to close the loop by briefly talking about some of the work we've done here at Johns Hopkins and at the Center for a Livable Future uh, concerning the health of workers in the meat supply chain. Before I do that, though, I wanted to discuss some of the challenges associated with learning more about food supply workers. So much of the work that CLF faculty like myself or our grantees have been engaged in has been aimed more directly at workers at animal rearing sites, or those IFAP operations that I've talked about before. Studying the impacts of occupational hazards on these types of workers is particularly tricky for a few reasons. First, IFAP sites are rarely considered workplaces by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA. Uh, since these sites are deemed agricultural by the agency, they're subjected to a broad exemption under the Occupational Safety and Health Act for Agricultural Operations that states that ag sites that employ fewer than 11 non-family employees are exempt entirely from OSHA oversight. It's generally understood that the majority of IFAP sites employ fewer than 11 non-family employees, and thus, persons employed in these facilities have no federally mandated workplace protections. Alongside this lack of protections comes a, a lack of information gathering. Very little federal data exists to support examinations of the working conditions of IFAP employees and the exposures they may incur on the job. 
Two other important reasons why it's difficult to study the risks faced by workers at IFAP facilities are related to retribution and trust. As has frequently been reported by employees at animal slaughter plants, workers in animal houses may live in fear of retribution from employers who learn that they've participated in health studies that could help implicate their places of employment or their employers in their exposures or related health concerns. Such fear, which is likely justified, can thus result in the employees of IFAP operations being unwilling to participate in health studies. For the few, the brave, who do end up being willing to participate in health studies, a period of relationship building to foster trust with the worker community is almost always necessary, especially to give the participating workers confidence that their confidentiality will be respected and that their livelihoods will not be put at additional risk as a result of their participation in the study. Because farm access is almost always denied to public health researchers, the majority of studies conducted to date require engaging workers outside of typical work hours and off-site from their jobs. As such, challenges exist in conducting studies linking chemical hazards to health outcomes. Consequently, much of the literature that exists examines risks posed by contact with pathogens at animal production sites. There's a heightened concern posed by many pathogens at IFAP sites in large part because of the use of antibiotics in the context of animal production, as was mentioned before. Research has shown that such uses of these drugs leads to the development and propagation of antibiotic-resistant bacteria that can cause very serious and difficult to treat infections. With those considerations in mind, I wanted to talk for just a little bit about a few studies either sponsored by or conducted by CLF personnel that look specifically at risks faced by workers at IFAP sites. Some work has been published that characterizes risks faced by poultry workers, and these studies date back to uh, the mid-2000s. One study, which looked at poultry workers on Maryland's eastern shore, which is a poultry production nexus, found that poultry workers were 32 times more likely to be carrying gentamicin-resistant E. coli in their stool than control participants taken from the same communities. It's since become common knowledge that gentamicin is extensively used in the poultry industry, in fact, gentamicin is routinely injected into chicken eggs at hatcheries prior to shipping the chicks off to production facilities. Another study of eastern shore chicken workers found that workers in industrial poultry operations were at increased risk of exposure to Campylobacter, and as a result, may be at elevated risk for adverse neurological outcomes like guillain barre syndrome as compared to community reference. More recently, work conducted in North Carolina has aimed to characterize risks related to Staphylococcus aureus, based aureus faced by workers at industrial swine operations. In one study, researchers compared workers at industrial swine operations to workers in swine operations that did not use antibiotics in their rearing protocols. The study found that workers at industrial operations were significantly more likely to be colonized with multi-drug resistant Staph aureus than workers at antibiotic-free operations. A follow-up study that looked longitudinally over 14 consecutive days at individual swine workers found that colonization with Staph aureus can be persistent among industrial hog workers and can last as long as 96 hours after the last work shift. And that raises the question as to whether workers can spread these bacteria to family members or among their social networks. Uh, while some work has been done to characterize these risks, I think we have a lot to learn. But that said, it can be argued very convincingly that we know enough now about the risks of our current dominant model of production to call for some pretty serious changes. I'm going to stop there to leave enough time uh, for the Q&A portion of the webinar, but since I already have the microphone, I thought I'd go ahead and ask the first question. And, and my question um, is directed to both of our, our speakers. Um, you know, given your fascinating presentations and, and given the audience we have here with us today of health professionals, what can we do? What, what's the role of health professionals in, in bettering the situation of, of food system workers? Well, I'll take that first. The, the, the first thing that I think that everyone can do is, um, at the risk of sounding like uh, a, a plug for the speakers, I mean, there's, there's plenty that can be done to support the kind of reporting that, that some of the speakers are doing in the, the series, um, and, and not just me, but you know, Chris Leonard was on a month ago and did a fantastic job in his book, the, the Meat Racket is Essential Reading. And then the organizations like the Food Chain Workers Alliance and uh, some of the, the, the watchdog groups that are, are 
staying on these issues um, from an organizational standpoint on a daily basis. Um, the thing that, that people can do, um, therefore, is, is inform themselves. And once they, they have that information, um, can support the organizations that, that, are, that share their interests and their goals. I suggest that approach primarily because, uh, you know, as much as I would love to say that these problems can be solved at the grocery store by what we buy and those sorts of things, I think that these problems are really much more systemic and require government involvement and require regulation. And the only way that that's really ultimately going to happen is through the work of some of these organizations that are, are pushing our lawmakers to do better. Thanks, Ted. So I agree with, yeah, I agree with everything what, um, that Ted said. Um, you know, I would just add that for us, it's really important for workers to have a voice in the workplace, whether it's through a union or through some other, you know, workers' organizations, a workers' committee, a workers' center, uh, and so public health advocates, you know, supporting those efforts, I think, would be would be a big boost for those efforts, um, and we're supporting policies to improve conditions, as Ted said, um, whether it's very specific to the meatpacking industry, or as I mentioned, I think. The good food purchasing policy is a, is a good model, and we're looking to expand that to other school districts and cities around the country. Fantastic. Yeah, uh, this is Rachel. I, uh, we're, we've been getting some questions coming in from the audience. And there are a few coming in here about OSHA standards and whether or not the size of the slaughterhouses that seems to make a difference, the number of employees in terms of oversight. Um, but we're, uh, questions have come up about the larger slaughterhouses and what the role of OSHA is in looking at employee, um, employee health um, at, at, on a larger scale. So I can take a stab at this. I, I saw there was a question as to, you know, now there is OSHA oversight in these facilities, so how how uh, much research or, or, or does public health research occur in these larger facilities? And I would say that uh, to a limited extent, yes, but I think public health researchers who seek access to study the different risks faced by workers in these work sites, you know, faces challenges. If you own and operate a, a slaughter facility, uh, you are able to deny access to at least public health researchers who are not affiliated with OSHA. and and so. Without that access, it, it's very challenging to study those workers. One study that was published this past year uh, by some colleagues of mine here at Hopkins uh, looked at slaughter and processing plant workers and compared them to their family members and other folks in their communities to examine whether uh, they had a different prevalence of uh, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus colonization. Uh, and what they found is there were actually very similar uh, prevalences of, of MRSA, but the key difference is that persons who were working in slaughterhouses, uh, the isolates of MRSA that were recovered from their noses were more likely to be resistant to a wide array of antimicrobial drug classes. So they were, in essence, carrying uh, resistant microbes in their nose that were, were very dangerous as compared to the people who lived in communities. And I know there's quite a sizable body of literature that's looked at uh, injuries in the context in the context of the slaughterhouse as well. But I, I think, again, the statement I made before, we're learning enough to know there are problems. Uh, we'd like to learn more. We'd be able to make a better case. But I, I think we know enough to know that some changes are, are necessary. Great. Fantastic. We've got another question here. This one is directed specifically at Ted. And the question is, your book lays out numbers of suffering from repetitive stress injuries, how many are actually completely disabled by this? Well, th those numbers are somewhat difficult to pin down in part because, um, as has been mentioned, a fair number of the people who work in these uh, packing plants to this day are, are undocumented workers. And many of them, when they're no longer able to work, simply move on to another locale and, and very often to another industry. Um, and m my own research has indicated that there's a kind of informal uh, path
pathway that exists actually for people who may be leaving one particular industry. They they follow the pioneers who have gone to uh, to other plants and to places where the work is is less repetitive. So they they tend not to file worker comp claims. They tend instead to um, to to move on to different locales. But the the, the research that has been done indicates that you know that that working within the packing plants, um, even with the underreported numbers, that it, it is estimated that that meat packers that that's the third most dangerous uh, in, job in the country, and the researchers believe that the that the reports of injury are underreported by about fifty percent. If we accept that, then it's far and away the most dangerous job that that exists still in this country, which means that um, that there are certainly plenty of people who are suffering um, permanent injury um, beyond the repetitive stress injuries and those sorts of things. The 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 amputations, the serious um, injuries that occur, and then also, as I've mentioned, some of the the, the unusual illnesses as well. Great, thank you. I have another question for you, Ted, uh, about your about your book and the number of times the Mayo Clinic comes up. I believe the yes. question comes up. It comes up five times in the book, and this person's wondering if you can talk kind of about the unlikely relationship between Mayo and Hormel historically and today. Yeah, it's it is a strange and interesting relationship. Um, the, the relationship really begins at a point when um, a number of the, the serums and, uh, and test uh, animals that, that the Mayo Clinic was reliant on at a, at a much earlier time, we're talking you know, in the 40s and in the 50s here, um, were supplied by Hormel. And Hormel actually continues to collect some organs that they, that they supply to uh, to the Mayo Clinic, either directly or through the Hormel Institute, um, which is there in Austin, Minnesota, and, and has a very close relationship with the Mayo Clinic, which is only about an hour away in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, but beyond that, um, the, the the Mayo Clinic took a very active role when when the Hormel Institute was founded after World War II in the antibiotic research that was being done um, at the Hormel Institute and in, in seeing the ways in which the research that Hormel was doing on hogs might have human applications and vice versa. And it's for this reason that the workers um, in Austin in particular continue to have a serious mistrust of the Mayo Clinic. Um, the Austin Medical Center, uh, which is just you know a short distance from the from the Hormel plant and is where all the injured workers are sent, is actually a branch of the Mayo Clinic, and the workers are are all concerned that the that the information that is supposed to be private patient information is being shared with Hormel. They uh, worry that they are not being adequately informed of what what sort of illnesses or injury they may have because of the financial relationship that exists between Mayo and Hormel. And I have no doubt that a good part of this ha is, is a sort of paranoia that has built up over time. But that paranoia comes out of uh, a an honest place, which is the financial relationship that exists between these organizations and, and only continues to grow. That makes a lot of sense. Um, we've got a question here for Joanne. It comes from Melinda. And her question is, there's so much propaganda out there against labor unions. How do we communicate the value of labor unions, especially in this situation? Um, well, yeah, it's very true. It's definitely a, it's been a concentrated campaign to discredit unions. and. Yeah, not that there. I know that there are some problems with some unions, but they're not as um, 
horrible, you know, the evil entity is just portrayed by conservatives in the right wing. Um, so, you know, I think the research that USCW did to show how union plants are producing safer food, have less re uh, food safety recalls, is helpful to get out there. Um, we also know, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I know that workers who are represented by a union earn higher wages. It's a very marked difference between union and non-union workers. Union workers also have more likely to have health insurance and other benefits like paid sick days, um, vacation time. So, yeah, so, yeah, we definitely appreciate help in trying to spread that word. Great. Thanks, Joanne. I have another question coming in that says, evidence-based practice relies on good data. As Steve has presented, he had a hard time getting data from small family farms. Ted and Joanne, what can you do to help you collect good data? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I mean, because part of the problem, is, as Keith mentioned, is that, that there is a real reluctance to allow any data to be gathered because what the only thing that can that can come out of that is some change to the way that things are currently run and for small operators as much as large operators the any small change any additional expense narrows the margin that they're operating on and so any sort of reform poses potential perils for small farmers and, and actually maybe more for small farmers than large operators. So I think one thing that that would help would be some some cooperation that would allow um, farmers to see that if there are going to be reforms that, that are going to be recommended, that there are also resources that will be made available to them to be able to make some of those changes. And I think that we would see much more cooperation, especially from independent producers, if they felt that uh, the changes that they were being asked to make would not only serve the common good, but would allow them to continue to run their operations profitably. Great. Thanks, Ted. Joanne, do you want to chime in on that, about getting good data from some of these smaller production facilities? Um, well, the way that we've been able to do research in some of our member or, uh, groups is really the organization getting resources to go and talk to workers, right? They they have relationships with workers or they can develop them outside of the workplace, um, developing relationships with the places that workers go, their church, you know, community clinics, places like that. So. Um, I think community organizations can really be helpful in, with that kind of research. Great. Thank you, Joanne. I have a lot more questions here. We'll try and get to as many as we can. Um, this is a question for Ted in regards to the brain machine. Do you know if this practice has now changed and been made safer for the workers? The, the, so the brain machine is no longer in operation um, as such, there <clears throat> there are different ways of harvesting brains, and um, using the pressurized air is not something that is done anymore. There are still machines that are in operation that split the skulls in half, um, and and the brains can be removed whole uh, from the hog in that way. But even that, uh, which was a system that was used in the Fremont, Nebraska Hormel plant. Um, when they came and checked workers for neuropathy there, uh, when the Nebraska Department of Health did that, they did find that there was, it was much less pronounced than in the workers in Minnesota, but that there was one case of, of that particular kind of neuropathy. And so I believe that they've halted that practice at that Hormel plant as well. But there are still other plants out there they, that collect the brains. They just do it in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. That's good news. <laughs> um, this question, a little bit, there's a few, yeah. Right. There's a few questions coming in about kind of citizens' response to this and whether or not they choose to stop eating meat 
or choosing alternative meat substitutes in a, as a response to what's going on in the meat industry and what impact that has on policies and changes within the system. Anyone has a response to that? I'll, I'll just say one thing quickly, and then I want to turn it over to Joanne, who I think can say much more on this. I, the one thing that I always just kind of toss into this, because everyone always says, um, you know, in reaction to the sorts of things that that I've been working on with the pork industry, everyone asks me, so have you become a vegetarian? Um, as if eating vegetables did not have some of the same sorts of consequences for workers. Um, and in, in places where the, the, the produce uh, production is heavily dependent on not only pesticides, herbicides, fungicides that are sprayed on these fields, but then also they're hand-picked by workers who very rarely have the sort of equipment that they need to protect themselves from the chemicals that they're exposed to. Um, there are there are problems um, where the workers are concerned in, in all parts of the food chain, and they really need to be, I think, addressed globally in order to avoid having the problem simply shifted from one place to another. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, would that, I would just add that the, the corporate concentration in the different sectors of the, of, you know, the meat industry is also a major problem. So, you know, I agree with what Ted said earlier. Sure, you know, I think folks can make individual choices and it can be somewhat helpful, but it's a larger structural issue. So the fact that four companies control 80% of the beef market in the U.S. and I think it's four companies control over two-thirds of the pork industry, you know, it's, um, we have a problem with, the mono with this, these monopolies, basically, right? Um, and so it's a systemic issue that we need to change federal policy and also you know, ensure that workers have a voice in, in keeping their workplaces safe and the food safe. Great. Thanks, Joanne. I'm going to ask one last question. I think we're coming to the end of the webinar here, our time. but. Um, this one comes in from Anita, and the question is, while policy changes are certainly called for based on the data shared, a multi-pronged approach from individual dietary changes to policy changes seems to be in order. So along the lines of what you were saying, um, Joanne, including corporate social responsibility for meat producing companies, is the CFL looking into collaborative, comprehensive models to tackle the various layers? individual, micro, and macro levels? I think that one's directed at Keith. Oh, I thought it said Joanne. Um, could you say the last part of that question one more time? You were kind of breaking up on my end. Oh, sure, yeah. Is the Center for a Livable Future looking into collaborative, comprehensive models to tackle the various layers of these issues, both on a micro, macro uh, level? I, I think we are. The way the center is organized is that, you know, we, we have four main functions. We're, we're as I mentioned, in the, in the routine uh, of conducting research and publishing that research, but we're also engaged in advocacy activities. Uh, I personally am involved in working with state and federal level legislators who are interested in promoting policies that can be useful in, in changing uh, the way things are done. Sometimes we end up feeling a little more frustrated <laughs> with the results of that work, not because of anything the legislators have done, but, but more, more targeted at our, at our current political system. Um, but we're also engaged in educational activities and communication activities that are geared towards taking the research that we've done and that others have done and, and turning it into a form that's, that's palatable and accessible to, to individuals who might want to change their own behavior or become advocates for, for the causes that we think are worthy. Um, and we've also been actively engaged in developing uh, educational programs and materials. As an example, um, on our website, uh, and we can share the link for this, we have a full high school curriculum uh, about the food system called Teaching the Food System. 
that is available to anyone who's interested, uh, geared towards high school teachers and, and maybe undergraduate uh, programs at colleges. Uh, and it, it includes uh, detailed lesson plans about every step of the food chain. And uh, I think some of the things that you've heard about today will be covered uh, in, that, in that curriculum. And, and that curriculum is available for free. So that's just one example of, of some of the ways that we try and, and translate what's done. And, and so in terms of collaboration, um, I, I think the answer is absolutely yes. We have a number of, of colleagues in the field um, at, at various NGOs who might be more geared towards working on changing policies and, and other groups that we might work with, like Food and Water Watch, as an example, who may uh, be organizing at the grassroots level to, to really prompt change among, among individuals. So, so the answer is yes. Great. Thanks, Keith. I think we've come to the end of our time. David, do you want to wrap up? We can't hear you, David. You might be muted on your end. David, can you unmute yourself, please? I am unmuted. Great. Perfect. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Good. <laughs> I was unmuted. I don't know what happened. Well, thank you, uh, Keith Nachman, and thank you to our presenters for a really great and interesting webinar. Um, everybody in the audience, you're automatically registered for the next two Meet Matters webinars. I want to give you a little heads up. In early December, we've got Harvard University's Walt Willett, Dr. Walt Willett, on what meat to eat. And uh, Keeve's colleague, Ronnie Neff, is going to be talking uh, on that webinar as well. And she's going to be talking about some of the experts to the USDA that are grappling with um, how to incorporate broader factors in the meat system with, with uh, the dietary guidelines for Americans. Uh, so some of these questions around health and sustainability beyond just nutrition come into play there. I think that'll be really interesting. And um, she'll also be talking about her new textbook that's come out on food systems and public health. So those in the audience on academe will want to not miss that. In January, then we hear from Dr. Martin Blazer, an infectious disease physician who looks at the microbiome and how our meat production system uh, uh, maybe impacting our gut health. So uh, we're really looking forward to all that. We have another series done in 2015 that deals with other prominent authors uh, uh, like uh, Ted Genoways, where we're going to have, for example, Dr. Daphne Miller on her book, Pharmacology. And it looks like uh, noted chef Dan Barber, uh, uh, whose book, Third Plate, uh, has come out and attracted quite an audience as well. So um, we do, I want to point you back to the website for registration and just note that if you have friends or colleagues that missed the webinar, we will put up a rebroadcast and if they register for the series, they'll be able to access that. Uh, at, uh, and on the landing site for the, web, for the webinars, you'll also see some resources that our speakers have put up and I know uh, um, Joanne Lowe gave us some links to more information at Food Chain Workers Alliance. And uh, as well, we'll have links to uh, Center for a Livable Future there. So in short, thank you again from Healthy Food Action. And we look forward to seeing you in early December for the next webinar. <laughs>